Hello chess fans, in this video I'm going to show you one of the most epic games of the FIDE Candidates tournament so far. It is round 11 and we are going to have a look in this video at the game of FIDE against tournament leader Jan Nepomnici. The Russian Grandmaster is in the lead together with Gukesh on 6 out of 10. And for FIDE this is a sort of must win situation. If he loses this game he will be 2 points behind. If he wins the game he will catch up with uh, Jan Nepomnici. So let's dive straight into the action. I will show you all the critical moments of this game. And just if you like this video or even my all my other videos posted on the channel, just please hit the uh, subscribe button. You make me a big favor by doing that. Thanks for doing so. Here we go. Fidit goes for one e4. e5, knight f3. And not a surprise, Jan Nepomnici plays once again for the third time this tournament. His beloved uh, Petrov defense. Knight takes e5, d6. And here, small surprise, because in earlier games with Pragnananda and Hikaru Nakamura, there followed knight f3, knight takes e4, d4, d5. Black placed its bishop on d6, and we got some very interesting games there. But we could also see that the theoretical lines there are just incomprehensible. It's very difficult to understand all the ins and outs. And Fidit has a totally different approach. He doesn't go for the main lines. He just goes back with the knight to c4. This has become quite uh, popular since the uh, World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Fabiano Caruana, who also played an epic game. Uh, in that game, there followed knight takes e4, queen e2, queen e7. And here, Magnus played the move knight e3, placing the knight on the um, e-file, avoiding any potential uh, queen exchange uh, in the, anytime soon. It's a, quite an interesting game. A lot of dramatic things happened in that game as well. But for this occasion, Fidit played here the move knight c3, attacking the knight on e4. So black is just going to take it. And white takes back with the b-pawn. And uh, now we see that the queens are there on the uh, e-file. So uh, these queens will be exchanged uh, very soon. The question is, who is going to take here first? Well, black says bishop g4. Attacking the queen, of course, you're not allowed to take because the king will come into a check. So here, white captures on uh, e7. The bishop takes back. And we see one of the uh, main ideas behind uh, white's uh, player is rook b1. So that the half open b file is used by the rook, hitting the pawn on b7. Therefore, black just plays the move b6, preventing that idea. White goes for d4 opening up the, the position so that the bishop can be developed. But to be honest, this doesn't look like a very impressive uh, opening preparation. Black is rock solid here, eyeing the uh, pawn on uh, a2, which is potentially a weakness. But Fidit has different ideas in mind as he brings up the a-pawn to, uh, to a4 with ideas of playing a5 very, uh, very soon. Castling kingside and here, Knight to e3 was played so that the bishop does have some uh, light squares to uh, to work with. L the bishop is no longer needed to keep the, the knight uh, supported at all. Black goes for bishop g5. And we see that, okay, bishop was not doing much on e7. It's uh, controlling this diagonal. If bishops will be exchanged, it would be great news for, uh, for, um, for black as well. So here, c4. White is uh, using its uh, little space advantage in the center, but black goes for rook e8. And um, even though there are probably no immediate threats, it's clear that you've got to watch out for potential issues along that uh, e-file. But white goes for h4, attacking the bishop. Bishop goes back to f6 to hit the pawn on d4. And well, you can defend the pawn in different ways with, uh, with the bishop, getting the, the bishop into the game in this way. But there follow the move c3, but all of a sudden I start to get a little bit concerned about white's position because his king is still in the center. That's not the main issue because queens have been exchanged. I don't think there will follow an, uh, a mating attack against the king, but mainly because the other pieces, they are not interacting that well with each uh, other. And after the next move c5, you see that black is challenging the pawn on d4 as well as the pawn on c3 indirectly. And uh, there's no convenient way to uh, to defend both uh, both pawns. So white plays here bishop d3. Now things are getting quite tactical as black does have the 
option to take twice on d4, which was not played in the game. There follow the move knight c6, but just one second. If we take on d4, c takes d4, bishop takes d4, black is a pawn up, but white's idea probably had been now to uh, to play bishop e4. If this would have been played, the rook is sort of trapped in the, um, in the corner, but after the move d5, well, you're avoiding uh, this uh, loss of material. White can take here uh, with a pawn, attacking the bishop. Bishop goes back, but I think black is absolutely all right. Also, in uh, in this case, you're attacking the pawn on a4. The knight can get into play. Rooks are connected. I don't think white's passed pawn on the d file is that uh, that dangerous. So I would take uh, definitely black here. But Napo had a different plan. He went for the move knight c6, which is very interesting as you do attack the pawn on d4 one more time. But here is the move d5 with a double attack on these two minor pieces. And what should black play here? Uh, he played the move knight e5, which is correct. I just want to point out that capturing first on c3 with check is not good because it does allow king d1. And if your idea is now to put a knight on e5, so that if you do take on e6, there's knight takes d3, White rather starts here with the move king c2, defending the bishop, attacking the bishop on c3, bishop on e6 is still hanging, so that after knight takes d3, king takes d3, both the bishop on c3 as well as the bishop on e6, they are both hanging. So bishop takes c3 is not possible, but look at this, knight e5 is played now anyway, with a counterattack on this bishop. And rather than taking first on e6, Fidet says, I want to take that pawn on h7 uh, first. King takes h7 to solve the check. Pawn, ta uh, pawn takes bishop. Black recaptures. And we here we see a position with still even material. But how to evaluate? I think black is absolutely comfortable with a beautiful pawn chain. And uh, also these pawns on the C file, they're isolated. They're potentially vulnerable. But at this point, they're still pretty well defended. So is this really bad for white? Well, it's a battle for the initiative. White first goes for the move king e2. And after rook a d8, now Fidit seizes the initiative on the side where he is better placed by advancing its king side majority. He goes for g4, great idea. Black goes g6 so that after g5, the bishop, which is under threat, it can come back to g7. Everything is still fine. Um, now, how are you going to play here as, um, as white? One idea could be to play h5, hoping to open up the files towards the king, but I never really think that the king is going to be in, in real danger of getting checkmated. So the, the strategy of white here is to keep these pawns on the board so that uh, the king on h7 will be restricted in his movement as well as the other pieces, of course. And that's in the long run, that can pose some, some serious uh, questions uh, to black here. Fidit opens up a new front with the move a5. He's hitting the pawn on uh, b6. Black captures the pawn. And now it's rook to b7, pinning this bishop on uh, g7. There are also ideas to take the pawn on a7, followed by taking the pawn on, um, on a5. So black decided here to block with its rook. Rooks are coming off the board. But now that rook is no longer there to guard that pawn on d6, and with the move rook d1, white is, once again, exerting pressure against um, one of uh, black's weaknesses. Black got to defend it by dropping back with the bishop. But now the knight comes into g4, which is a great spot for the knight. If this knight is ever going to move, there is knight f6 with a knight fork winning the rook. So black moves the rook first. Rook b8, that is the open file. And the bishop now comes out to f4, hitting the pawn on d6 one more time. What to do? You can simply defend it by playing something like uh, rook b6. Looks like a reasonable option. If white goes rook a1, you are uh, hitting the pawn. There's rook a6. If you go rook b1 with the idea to infiltrate and hit the knight, uh, enter on the seventh rank with a massive attack, the only thing black can do is go back and this will lead to a repetition of uh, moves. So black could have gone for that, but play the move rook to b2 check. And uh, here the king comes to f3. White is still thinking about taking the pawn on d6. If that happens, white will get access to, um, to the 7th uh, and probably even the 8th rank. So black prevents it by playing e5, taking the bishop. Bishop goes back to e3. 
But you see that by playing this move e5, there are new possibilities even for the king trying to walk into black's uh, position. And here again, various options. You could drop back with your rook, but of course that's not what uh, Nepal had in mind. He played knight b6, attacking the pawn on c4, but that does give white the possibility to come in with the knight to f6. Now the knights are not getting exchanged. The king has only two squares to go to, but if you go to g7, there will follow knight e8, check, followed by knight d6, pawn number one is gonna drop, second pawn will follow as well, and very soon the rook will come in. So that is not looking very attractive to black. King h8 was played instead, but obviously this king also doesn't feel very comfortable in the corner. White goes for this move, king e4, beautiful idea. And what I want to show you here, guys, is that if black would consider taking that pawn, the king walks in, and after knight takes e3, f takes e3, I mean, you are down three, uh, two pawns as uh, white, but you're about to go for a move like king e6, king f7, this bishop is in serious trouble and the white rook will find a way. I don't know how yet, but maybe via the A file, maybe via the D file or via the F file, he will find a way to infiltrate at, uh, at some point. Things are looking incredibly bad because white is dominating here thanks to a better king, better minor piece and a better rook. Back to the game. Black didn't capture that pawn on c4, kept that knight here to control the d5 square. There followed a4. Black is using that passed pawn. And of course, imagine that pawn coming to a2. Things are uh, getting uh, worse and worse. So white played rook a1 so that the knight got to keep that pawn defended. If you do take on c4, rook takes a4, attacking the knight, and soon the rook will infiltrate. So what should black do? Probably just try to get the king to a better square. King g7 with the idea to get the king around is something uh, which appeals to me. Um, but instead, Nepal went here for the move rook to b3. He's going after that pawn on c3. And now big moment in the game, which was overlooked by both players. White had this fantastic idea of playing the move h5 with the idea that if you do take, the king comes in to f5, and you are just a few moves away from setting up mating threats against this king. Because imagine you take on h5, the king goes to g7, a rook will be on h7, that will be checkmate. So the white king plays a crucial role in this uh, endgame. There are other possibilities as well. It's not a forcing line, but definitely h5 with the idea to get a rook to h1 and the king to f5 does give a new impulse to white's attacking play. In the game, feed it played it in a much more solid way. He decided to defend the pawn on c3 by going back with the king to uh, d3, defending the pawn. Black goes a3, the bishop goes back to c1, so you're threatening to take the pawn on a3, but there's also another threat, because if you now, for instance, play something like king g7, it's king c2, and this rook is no longer defended by that pawn on uh, a4. The rook is just trapped on the b-file. Beautiful idea. Instead, maybe knight a4 could be played with the idea to take on c3, or in worst case, the rook may come back to, uh, to b7. That looks like a reasonable option for, uh, for, for black, but they follow the move a5. It is a very logical move, because your idea is that in case of king c2, black brings up the other pawn and now the rook is defended again. But instead, white decided now to capture the pawn on a3. Very important pawn. But look at this, guys. This position, it looks like white is making progress, eliminating pawn number one. Probably pawn number two will follow soon as well. Structurally, uh, the bishop is bad. The king is bad in the corner. Uh, it looks like white is having great uh, ideas here to, to make uh, progress. But black had been calculating the following line. d5. He, his idea here is that if you do take the pawn on d5, there is knight takes d5, c takes d5, and now there is the move c4 with a discovered check on the king. If king takes pawn, it's rook takes a3. Rooks can be swapped now. But here, remarkably enough, despite being a piece down, white is winning here. This was missed by both players. King b5 is a fantastic idea. The plan is... Pretty straightforward, just to run with your C-pawn and together with the D-pawn and one of these pawns will be promoted very fast. One simple line I want to show you is that if you do play E4, now don't take the pawn on A5 because of bishop C5, you're taking the pawn on F2, 
and then the e pawn will be decisive. So instead, what White should do is play the move c4 here. And um, for instance, if you do play the move a4, trying to deflect the king, um, you're not going to take the pawn, but you're running with your c pawn. Bishop takes c5, probably the only way to stop the pawn. And now, after king takes, both sides are running, but in the end, it is white who is uh, queening just uh, faster and uh, this queen end game is technically winning for uh, for white that was a very long sequence of moves but it was a typical jan nepomnesi moment i would uh, say i mean he is clearly worse but he is very resourceful looking for these kind of uh nice counter attacking ideas and being low on time feed it trusted his opponent he didn't capture and once again he played it way too safe. He decided to go back with the king to c2 to attack the rook. But now it's d takes c4. Knight to e4 back. These double pawns, they are not dangerous, at least not now. And white is still in control. Rook b5, defending the pawn. Rook goes to d1, trying to enter on d8. So the bishop goes to e7. All the squares on the d-file are covered, so there's no way to infiltrate. White goes rook e1, and the king comes to g7. Now all the immediate threats are over. Probably the position is around equal, but the game goes on. Knight to d2, so that the knight on b6 can't move because it will hang the pawn on um, c4. Bishop to d6, knight e4, bishop e7. We do have... A possible repetition of moves. If white goes back, probably black would have to go back as well. And that leads to a threefold repetition eventually. But white played here the move knight to g3. Also attacking the pawn on uh, e5. But rather than defending it with the move bishop d6. Because that would run into the move h5 and white breaks through. You can't take the uh, pawn on h5 because of knight f5 with a knight fork. So instead, after knight g3... Black played here the counter move, rook to b3, attacking the bishop. Now, if you do take on e5, hitting the bishop, there will follow bishop d6 and black is out of the woods. Instead, bishop c1 is played. Great idea. But now the knight comes into d5, attacking the pawn on c3 together with the rook and the knight. Various options. White decided here to go back with the knight to e4 to defend the pawn. But now the king comes to the center. White goes bishop d2. The pawn goes to a4, rook to a1, knight comes to b6. I don't see how white is making any progress here. And in fact, after bishop e3, the rook goes back. It defends the pawn on c5. After knight d2, the rook can get behind the passed pawn. So that is another thing white got to think about in the next couple of moves. And how are you going to stop the pawn? Maybe with a minor piece, like you can block it with your knight. That's probably what I would have done. Or maybe even use the bishop for that purpose. Frankly speaking, I didn't like this move king b2 too much. Even though it's still playable, I have the feeling that the king is not nicely placed at the edge of the board. I would have rather kept it in the center. Now rook b5 is played, cutting off the king. Once again, rook to c1, king to f5. The king is on its way to g4 and wrap up the pawn on h4. So white plays f3, guarding these two squares. The king cannot infiltrate, but... Black is strengthening its position by attacking the bishop on e3. It does sacrifice the pawn on a4. The king hits the rook. The rook goes back to b8, but the king is still cut off. And note also that the rook on c1, it cannot move away because then the pawn on c3 will be hanging. Now, once again, various options. You may just move your bishop because it's threatened to be taken, but they're followed now this move. Knight takes c4. Just capturing a pawn. White is a pawn up. But black play the move e4. Now you do initiate the exchange of pawns. Pawn takes e4. King takes. Black is hitting the bishop on e3. The bishop goes back. And look at this. The king comes in to d3. It does hit the knight as well as the pawn on c3. If you move the knight away with check, the king will come to d2. Attack the rook, rook goes away, and you're going to take the pawn on c3. Black is seizing the initiative, as now it is the black king, who is much more active. 20 moves ago, it was a totally different story. White's king was superior to the black king, but times are changing. Here we see that after king d3, white doesn't move the, um, the knight away. There followed bishop g3, attacking the uh, rook on b8. So if you do give a check, you can still... Uh, do something uh, about it. Let's say rook a8. Uh, I guess that here the move 
uh, King to uh, B3 can uh, can indeed still be played, and everything is well covered now. However, uh, there followed the move Knight takes C3 check, and this is another big moment in the game because probably with a move like Rook takes C3, White is still able to hold this bishop endgame. For instance, everything gets swapped now. You put your bishop on E5. And uh, it's two versus two. Black is probably trying to push here a little bit more, but it should be defendable for uh, for white. However, after knight takes c3 check, the king instead, it went to a3. But now it is rook to b4 with check, with massive pressure against that uh, knight on c4. And this is the key moment in the game. Let me show you the following line. Knight b2 was played in the game with check, but... Instead, you should play this move, knight e5 check. If you play here this move, king to d2, attacking the rook, rook goes to g1, there is this move, c4. What on earth is happening? Rook b3 is a mating threat. Look at this, the king is caught, caught at the side of the board. Bishop to e1 check. And uh, now after moving the king somewhere, let's say you go to e2, you may take that knight on c3. There will follow now rook to b1 with discover check. The bishop blocks it. You give away that bishop consciously so that black captures it. King a4. Now you do take the rook. After king takes b4, black is going to lose that c pawn. You can go rook h1, king takes c4, rook takes h4. King goes to d5, but on the next move, you're taking the pawn on g6. White will eliminate the remaining pawn, and that means that it will be a rook versus knight. That is a theoretical draw. This was the chance for white still to save the game. But look now, guys. Knight b2 was played, but it runs into the move. King d2 attacking the rook, and the rook is not having many squares. For instance, if you play here this move, rook to h1, so you're trying to... First of all, save your rook, but also give a number of checks from the side. Here, look at this brilliant endgame idea. Here you can sacrifice the rook on h4. So the point is that if you take this rook, now the diagonal for the bishop has been cleared and the king is just getting checkmated at the side of the board. Bishop d6, bishop takes d6. It's a very unusual mating pattern also because the knight on b2 is preventing the king from getting back into the game. Remarkable finish of the game could have been like that instead rook h1 was not played rook f1 on the board they follow the move c4 anyway so rook b3 is another mating threat again rook f2 check knight comes to e2 bishop goes to e5 and this is still a tricky idea because for instance if you do play rook to b5 with a discovered check which was not played there is this idea king a4 and you can't win the bishop on e5 because of knight takes c4 with a knight fork white is still in time to save the game instead of playing this move rook to b5 c3 guys that is the way to play here to attack the knight if you take on c3 you can simply take with the king and white cannot really take on uh, e2 because well white is attacking this bishop so after any discovery discover check you're going to take the bishop but not after rook to e4 because rook takes e7 is not possible black is giving a check and you do win the rook that means that bishop takes c3 is not possible white went for the move rook f7 to hit the bishop right away rook b7 discover check played anyway if you do take on e7, rook takes e7, this endgame is completely hopeless because black is an exchange up and the c pawn is way too strong. Also, going away with your king to a2 can be met by different moves, but rook takes b2 is the simplest one. Instead, king a4 was played in the game and once again there are various options, including just to take the knight, but I also think that Napo choose a very pragmatic solution by just advancing the pawn, threatening to get a new queen, Knight c4 was played. There was not much else white could do here still. This is the sort of last trick because if you carelessly move your king to d1, then all of a sudden it's white who still is able to give checkmate. But that's not going to happen in the most important tournament of the year. King d3 was played instead. You're attacking the knight as well. The knight went back to b2. And after king e4, this is the heartbreaking moment of the game. As Fidit realized that he had completely screwed a winning advantage on multiple occasions. He had serious chances to uh, to uh, to win the game even. 
he resigned after this move because here bishop is hanging you're threatening to promote the pawn and thanks to this victory the most important game of the tournament for Jan Ned Pomnici so far. He manages to maintain the lead. He could have dropped back to second or even third place. But because of this win, he is actually even in the sole lead with uh, uh, a fantastic uh, score of uh, plus three after uh, 11 rounds. So he is on uh, five and a half, uh, sorry, on seven out of uh, 10. And uh, well, things could have gone completely differently. And uh, that is very important victory a typical victory for him he managed to win these kind of games in uh, in earlier candidates uh, events as well so is this going to be an historic event once again is Jan Nepomnici going to win the uh, candidates tournament 2024 for the third consecutive uh, time in a, in a row would be very very impressive if that happens um, anyway this was the most dramatic game of the tournament so far, at least in my opinion. But I would not be surprised if within 24 hours I will post a new video where another dramatic game is played. Because there are three more games to go and anything can still happen. Stay tuned for the latest updates on the Candidates Tournament. And uh, also, please hit the subscribe button. If you do like this video, give it a like. Let me know in the comments. All your support is very much appreciated. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.